Hello, heavy things. Lightly, John here's First Things Foundation. Hey, two things before we get started with this excellent interview. Classy Baby, this iconic company in Seattle, has dedicated a candle to First Things Foundation. For the next six months, when you buy this candle, it's on the screen right now. It's the Gratitude Green Gorgeous Candle. When you buy that, $3 goes to First Things Foundation every time. Go buy it. Great company helping us help others. Hey, one more thing. You want to go to the Art of Tamada? It's out. Tickets are available. April 1st, we start selling tickets. A weekend, room, food, supras, big giant parties at night, but also deep philosophical, theological conversations about what it means to offer hospitality. In Washington, we're doing it in Leavenworth at the Sleeping Lady Resort, July 7 through 10. Reverse weekend. Take Monday and Tuesday off instead of Thursday and Friday. We start on that Sunday the 7th, three nights, philosophy jams, hookah, supras, but also Vesper Stamper, Richard Rowland, talking about the deep stuff involved with hospitality. The revolution begins at the table and ends with a toast. That's what I hope you'll join us for. We're also doing the Florida event, November 7th through 10th. Tickets available now. And this is my interview with a classical educator that gives us, well, he, he fields the hard questions because I'm a little bit of a cynic about education in the new world. Let's see what Jason Kairos from Founders Classical Academy has to say on heavy things lightly. Jason is with us. Jason Kairos, right? Do I, am I saying it right? I'm That's saying correct. It right. That's correct. You, um, so we're in this like mojo now after talking to Andrew Kern. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been speaking at a number of places, including Circe Foundation, uh, the Circe Institute, and about classical education. Because I think it has something to do with this concept that we're doing on the podcast, Old World, New World. So you're a headmaster with public school experience. What, how about this? Let's start with this. What is classical education and why should, why should we care? Mm -hmm. I mean, I care because you're an Orthodox Christian guy, right? Greek that's, guy. That's correct. Yes. So why should non-Greek people care about classical education? How about that? We'll have fun with that. Well, let, let me start with it, just a basic definition or description. You, you probably know, interacting with Circe Institute people and others, that uh, this is a this is a relatively new movement. It's a it's a it's a neoclassical movement. You know, trying to restore something that was lost, and even hashing out a specific definition is kind of interesting. You can hear different things from different people or different emphases, I should say. And I would just start simply by saying, and, and, and this would be if if, if a if I bumped into somebody who had heard something about classical education, wanted to know what it, what it is, I would say it's, a, it's an true way of educating a human soul in accordance with its nature. So ultimately, it's an education and wisdom and virtue aimed at the good life, which is very different than the, the, the telos, let's say, in, in, modern schools, in, in public and many private schools for that matter, which is purely economic. So I, I was a, a teacher and administrator in, in public schools for, for many years, and everything was about two things, which really were one thing ultimately, college and careers. Everything is about preparing students for the workforce. And, and, and what, what I used to hear all the time in these public school settings, at trainings, et cetera, was... You know, we've got global competitors, China, so forth and so on, and our students have to be competitive in the global market. So therefore, it's a utilitarian end that's economic, which, which means that, that, that educators, policymakers see our children, they see us as economic units uh, to, to benefit the market. And, and I, think, I don't think that's how most parents see their children. I, I don't think that's um, how they want to form them. But that's that's the only that's the only game in town in, in in most places. So what classical education is trying to do is to say, look, we're human beings. 
we have a human nature. There's a particular way that humans ought to be educated. And the first and most important purpose is uh, for someone to become a noble human being who will live well. And, and if you if you educate a child in, in this classical manner, he or she will be more than ready for the training they're going to get at some point for a job, a vocation, military, whatever it is. But we have to put first things first. So we, we've, mm -hmm. we've been putting the cart before the horse uh, for, for too long. So you're doing that in Texas at That's Founders correct. Academy, right? That's correct. How do the Texans receive this idea that it's less about utility and more about, I don't know, morality or virtue? How, 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 do, the, how do Texans receive this? Well, considering that uh, Texas has many, many classical schools, both private and, and charter, I think they, they're accepting it very well. I give many tours at our school. I do a lot of public information meetings for families. And whether or not the people that are there knew about classical education coming in, they're very receptive, you know, to the message, you know, when they get it. It's it's sort of like, um, uh, you know, finding the homeland of your heart's desire. Like you didn't know exactly what it what it was, but as soon as you got there, you realized this is it. And I, I, I mean, I think I could convince, you know, 98% of the people that classical education is the way we ought to be educating children. I really do. No matter the religious background, the political background, if you if you lay it out properly to a parent, uh, that parent is going to say, yeah, you know, you're right. This is what we ought to be doing, not this other. Okay. So what, if I'm a guy buying your education, I'm buying it, what actually happens to my student? Do they study math? Mm -hmm. They do. They do. And why do they study math? Now, I know all these, I, I'm playing the foil, right? I'm having fun. <laughs> I want to lay it out before we get into the philosophy right. and to the, and really to the the anthropology of it. I want to find out, like, I think that stuff you're offering is being offered because of the way you think of humans. Mm -hmm. Like, what you think a human is, mm -hmm. is probably the answer to the question is why your curriculum looks the way you do. But just like, keep going. So, so there's math because math is a classical discipline. Does it work like that? No, there's math because as human beings, we have ways of communicating and understanding things. And so we think about, let's say, literacy and numeracy, which are two big areas of focus in education, right? In any mode of education, what we, what we call the linguistic arts or the language arts are a mode of communication, human to human, right? In community, whereas math, the mathematical arts or mathematics in general, that's a, that's a type of communication. Numbers are, are, are a way of communicating, but they help us to understand the natural world. So if we're going to live well, understand ourselves, understand the world around us, our, our larger communities, then we have to be educated in this language, right? And so I would, I would argue that every single human being needs a certain modicum of the language arts and mathematical arts in order to live well. It doesn't matter what you do with your life in terms of a, of a career vocation, but just to, just to function properly, these are, the, these are the essentials. And so I would say... Just to expand a little bit on that, if we talk about like, what are the basics, you know, say a hundred years ago, people might've talked about the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. I, I mean, that's mm -hmm. even, you know, that's limit, limiting, I'm saying classical mode of things. And so we'd say there's literacy, there's numeracy, there's rich content, by that I mean knowledge domains and, and virtue, right? But put another way, we'd say, we want to teach children to read, to write, to think, to calculate, to speak well, to have knowledge that helps them to understand their humanity and the world around them, uh, that ennobles their character so that they can live well and flourish as citizens. And that last part is critically important. Look, we live in the United States. You know, we talk about certain kinds of, of, uh, of liberties that we cherish here. And if you want to live well in a free society and maintain a free society, then you have to be well-educated and virtuous, which is, is part of our school's motto. Our, our school's motto is knowledge, virtue, and liberty, or scantia, virtus et libertas in Latin. The, the, if you read not just the writings of, of all the founders that wrote, but people that came after them, they, they, they created something wonderful with this republic, but they said, in order to keep it, 
we need well-educated and virtuous people. You, you can't have one or the other. Uh, you have to have both. I mean, for, for obvious reasons, you can, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're ignorant, you can be deluded, right? If you're uh, a wretch, you have to be uh, guided, you know, by a, by a firm hand. So, so tyranny, you know, is necessary. So in order, in order to keep mm. the freedoms that we have, we, we need both of these things. And, you know, more than that, and this is uh, most important to me as an Orthodox Christian, we don't, we don't want to simply prevent political tyranny but we want to prevent uh, tyranny of the passions, right? So, so we want to be free of the passions to the greatest extent possible. And so this right. education, which is formative, helps you on that path as well. Okay, let's keep going. I'll be the, I'm having fun because I like all this, but I'm going to keep going with, so classical education, many classical thinkers, are pre-Christian. Mm -hmm, that's right. So if you're using a timeline of ideas, so, and let's say the ideas actually, let's say that they don't exist in an internal form like Plato might say. Let's just say they come about through evolutionary process. A lot of the thinkers who are the founders of what you're describing are pagans. In other words, if they're shooting for... The idea that when you study with me, Plato, mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. Aristotle, when you study with me, I'm going to lead you to the highest and most virtuous forms. They couldn't have said Christ mm -hmm. in time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My guess is you think they were talking about Christ on some level anyway. Mm -hmm. Or is the Christian part of classical education not relevant, not important? How do you, how do you sort that out? Well, it is important, but but thinking about those pre-Christian thinkers, what they were engaged in was what we call the universals, right? Truth, beauty, and goodness, and, and others like justice. Uh, but as a, as a Christian, you'd say, well, truth is not merely a concept. Truth is the word of God. Truth is Christ. And all truth flows from him, right? Uh, we, we would say in the Orthodox Church that the energy is you know, of God. Uh, truth is truth is one of those attributes, right? Uh, but they were they they didn't have the revelation that the Hebrew people had. So Socrates, Plato, and the rest. But what what they did have was uh, a rational mind that was inquiring, that was was engaged in wonder, that uh, also you know looked at the natural world and said, okay, we can discern truths from the things that we see around us. And so, you know, the combination of those things would bring them to a certain understanding of, of truth, of, of, of a universal, of a universal good, of a standard of beauty that, you know, from a Christian perspective, you know, brings you maybe to the highest point that philosophy could bring somebody, which is to the understanding that there are these universals and that there is some type of deity, that there is a God, right? Obviously the revelation mm. has to bring you the rest of the way. And so what they did was wonderful. It was incomplete though, right? And so, right. yeah. No, 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 keep going. Cause I, so, so then is, is the Christian part then, cause here's where it gets tricky for me. Yes. Because I think I would have liked this education. Mm -hmm. Here's the I think you would have loved me. it. The Christian. Yeah, I had a public school classic. I went I went for a year in public school uh, uh, in Wisconsin, and then I moved around a ton mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. made New York my home again. But okay. I was a public school kid. And you know what public school did is it, it told whether it was a lie or not. It told the narrative that this is for everybody. Mm-hmm. And that our reading, writing, arithmetic does something like give a baseline to everybody so that they can have an opportunity to go be anybody mm -hmm. they want to, mm -hmm. to develop their life. Um, it feels like classical education. It, I don't know that ever in history it existed as something for the common person. Mm -hmm. if, if you look at the way it's charted, it not, I mean, Plato's not even trying to educate. 90% of the population right. He's in the Republic. It's like not even a thing, right? right. Um, this is a classic um, 
way to defame classical education is that it's really not for everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and so my, my question is, is when you start to provide these ideas, which I think are really beautiful and good, and we tried at the school that I started with a friend, well, she started and I was her, we did it together down in Florida. We had real ideas to try to invest all the kids in these really cool classical ideas. But is it possible? Is it possible to take this framework called America with this public school called Germanic, you know, coming mm -hmm. from Europe in the, and then take this framework and then lay classical education on top and say, everybody come get your classical education. Is that, is that possible? Yes. Well, so, so, so let's see yeah, let's go back. You're right. You know, what we, what we think about as classical education or traditional liberal arts education going back to Greece and Rome was not for everybody. It, it was for, for the nobles. It was for the aristocrats. It was for those that had the time to engage in those studies. Yeah, because, that's right. Look, that's you, right. you, you with right. a history background, you know, for most of human history until this day, most people on the planet have to work a lot. Like, there are many places around the world where mm -hmm. people get very minimal education, not because they don't want it, but because they don't, they don't have the time. They have to survive. Right. And so okay. this is how it was in the ancient world. So let's just take Athens, where Socrates and Plato were from. Uh, you know, it was an education for citizens who were citizens. Well, it was it was in the beginning, the nobles, which is a small percentage of the overall population in the city. And they're being trained or formed to be statesmen. Right? They've got to all participate in their direct democracy in the assembly which means they have to not just show up, but they have to speak, they have to vote. If they don't speak well, they get tomatoes thrown at them, right, uh, <laughs> et cetera. Uh, and eventually we get, you know, this group of people called the sophists, right, who are, who are training all these young men to win arguments, whether they're right or wrong. And this is where we get this idea of relativism, relativism, uh, relativism from originally. Mm. And then, of course, Socrates and the others come along and say, no, you know, we, we've got to educate in a formative way that leads people to truth, right? Uh, but here's so and that and that pretty much continues for most of Western history, where it is only a small segment of the population that's getting this. But in both the UK and in the United States, well, the colonies originally and then the United States, things began to expand. And if you think about in this country, in, in New England, even in the, in the 17th century, everybody that was that lived in towns was being educated. Literacy was 97, 98 percent higher yeah. than it is now. And, and I'm, when, I'm, when I say literacy, I mean true literacy. These people were reading the scriptures. They were reading, you know, ancient texts, uh, significantly, yeah. you know, more yeah. complex than what many of our kids can do today, you know, in the K-12 uh, age level anyway, right? Uh, and so th this began to expand first there and eventually uh, everywhere else. But the founding fathers themselves, and this is one of the revolutionary things that they did, Jefferson, Madison, and, and others, they promoted public education, not the deep classical education they received where you studied Latin, Hebrew, Greek all day long in order to go to college, you needed to show mastery in those areas, but a, a type of classical education that included some ancient language, history, you know, what, what they call the science of government, et cetera, et cetera, in order to do what I explained before, which is to, to, to promote liberty, human liberty. And so in this neoclassical uh, movement that we're in, what we're doing is greater in, in, in one sense than what the ancients and others did. We, we're we're opening, the, opening this up to everybody. And he, here's the thing, like what we say in, in particular in the classical charter school movement, that we're democratizing classical education because there is no tuition. Anybody can come and get this education and everybody ought to have it. Yeah, and, there you and, go. Right, and, and in terms of the, the it, I, I, this isn't coming up, but what, you know, in, in terms of the kind of classical school that, that we have at Founders Classical Academy, we call it an American classical education, right? Uh, we're, we're getting this classification, mm. this, this classical education in a particular place in time, the United States. And think about this. You know that for most of human history, everybody was a subject to a king, to a queen, to a monarch, to a pharaoh, etc. In the United States, we eschew that word. We're not subjects, we're citizens. Right? We're supposed to participate. Here's the thing. One, one of the, the key elements of a classical education is the mastery of rhetoric. Well, why rhetoric? Why should somebody be able to read, excuse me, to write and speak well? Well, as a citizen, 
you've got political, religious, and other kinds of cultural topics. Think about the mayhem we're in right now and, and how, how yeah. more voices are needed. If you can't speak well and convince somebody of the truthfulness of your convictions, which is what rhetoric is in the end, then you're shut out of citizenship. You need to be able to speak to your family, to your neighbors, to your friends, to your associates at work, to people that you meet and have dialogue. And of course, sometimes you realize, oh, maybe I, I didn't have that quite right. And you learn something which is beneficial. But if you do have the truth, you're, you're helping to spread that. All right. Can I tell you about an actual event that happened to me while living in West Africa? Absolutely. I just want to hear what you think about this. Guys, this is Jason, uh, Mr. Jason Kairos. Did I say it right? I'm not saying Karis it right. Karis is fine. Karis is good. Yeah. Karis. Uh, he's the headmaster at Founders Academy in, in Texas. And we're having fun. And he's he's part of this crew that I've gotten to know through Circe. Um, and I might sound adversarial. Maybe I am a little bit, but not really. Because... So my problem is, is I keep working in this field with First Things Foundation with mm -hmm. young people that are living in like Sierra Leone, um, Mozambique and the Georgian Republic. And though Georgian is an Orthodox Christian country, classical education is probably not what's been going on there. Mm -hmm. um, but this happened in Sindala in West Africa. There was a rebellion. This is in the early 90s. It was mm -hmm. a revolution where Musa Traore was overthrown. I think they executed his wife. I, it was going on while I was there. Mm -hmm. And literally while I was there, then uh, an assembly, uh, a, a reform took place, a political mm -hmm. reform where there was now an assembly that could freely operate and represent the people. And the way they did it is, is the chiefs of local villages and local regions were then going to vote on behalf of the people. Mm -hmm. And so the, the people then had an expectation, at least the educated Malians, educated in the French tradition of, you know, liberté, égalité, fraternité, like the French Revolution, mm -hmm. they then were teaching villagers to speak to their chiefs in a way that allowed their chiefs to vote on their behalf. Now that's happening in real time in this little village. Right. And I'm watching it as an American. And there was actually a day when the chiefs were voting. And I said to Takadi, my mother there, my, my, she adopted me as a Peace Corps volunteer. I said, are you excited? Are you to, to vote, you know, to talk to the chief? And she said, that's not for me. It's like got to do with me. They do that. I do this. Everybody agreed with her. That was the common understanding of politics. It's not for me. Right. Um, I think that describes classical, the classical world better than any kind of word associated with democracy. Mm -hmm. They're not connected to me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think classical education is not, is not consistent with democracy. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, first of all, w w the, w what you described to me. What do you is think about Takati? What do you think about my 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 adopted? What what did I need to tell her? Yes, Takati, snap out of it. Well, Learn your letters. Yeah. Well, I think what you described to me is almost a type of representative. You know what we think of a Republican government. You know, so look, I I. As a as as a student of history, as somebody who loves Republican style government, little R, right? Uh, I don't like direct democracy. I I think like the founders that democracy mm. and like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle that democracy uh, leads to despotism, you know, of the mob, right? So I I don't have a problem with representative government. So if you have chiefs, if you have rep, you know rep, noble representatives who will actually represent the people. We're getting input from other members of their community and then making votes. That that that's a good thing. That's not necessarily inconsistent with classical education, but uh, the the thing about it is, just thinking about Mali, since you you, you know you brought that up, you, you probably know that um, there was liberal arts education in Mali. You know, in 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 parts of Africa, with the with the expansion of 
you know, the uh, of, of Islam uh, during some ages there, they had a rich tradition again among the elite. There you right? go. They no, a, they did. This they, is super interesting. They had I love a, this. They had a rich tradition of what we would call the liberal arts, uh, you know, in those in in those areas. And, um, you know, of course, it, it died out over time, uh, much earlier than it died out in the West, you know, but uh, you, you could, con you could, so in speaking to your, your, uh, your friend there, you could connect back to that history and say, th this is, this was something that, you know, was a great part of your civilization uh, a few hundred years ago and, and ought to be restored. And here's why. I, how about this? I think everyone who listens to my podcast is starting to get irritated with me because I always bring in Islam. Mm -hmm. The Islamic scholars of the 9, 10, 11 centuries, they feel like they're doing a lot of classical education to me. Yes. They've, they've inherited or they've picked up Aristotle. They're, they're translating the classics. Their scholars sit in symposiums and figure stuff out, write laws according to the Quran. Mm -hmm. Can a, can a, can a Muslim be, what's a Muslim do who's already like desiring a classical education and they walk into a classical Christian mm. school, would they feel more at home than say a, an American new atheist or a, an American secular materialist? I mean, Does I would Jesus part screw everything up. Well, I would, I would, I, you know, obviously that might be different person to person, family to family, but I would think they would prefer the idea that there is a higher power, at least at the minimum, uh, you know, than, than a secular, even military. And that atheist. happens in your school. Well, okay. So the higher power conversation okay, so, it must happen, right? Right. So, so in our school, being that it's a charter, you know, in public, ultimately we, you know, we can't, Pray with students. We don't have worship services. Um, you know, we're not we're not um, you know trying to convert anybody to a particular Christian confession or anything like that. But the thing is, the texts that you're reading, whether it's literature, history, philosophy, etc., are dealing with these grave topics uh, yeah. of the yeah. of the perennial, yeah. perennial issues of, huma of, of humanity, especially in, the, in mm -hmm. the West. And when I say West, I include say Eastern Christendom, even the Middle East, North Africa. It, it's it's pretty large in scope, right? So you're, you're thinking about these universals. Uh, you're, you, you will be reading things about God and discussing them. And that's, I think, one of the differences between our school and a, and a, and a conventional public school. In modern times, what, what has happened in these ultra secular schools is they said, you know what? We don't want to offend anybody, or, or maybe they're actually just antagonistic toward the Christian faith in particular. So they'll say, we're not going to read this, this, and this text because it's written by a Christian author and has these allusions and themes in it, we're not going to cover history as it ought to be covered because we don't want to uh, get delve into these religious realms. But the problem with that is religion is one of the main dynamics of history as it is in literature, right? Mm -hmm. So we teach those things that have historically been taught, which means that we're going to have those discussions in the classroom. Again, the teacher is not you know, evangelizing, right? We're allowing the students to talk. What's in the text? What are the ideas that you glean from this? What are your views on this? But then we leave the particulars to the family. So the Muslim student, the Hindu student, even the agnostic student, they do with it what they want. If they talk to their parents about it, they're going to get hopefully more formation at home in that regard. Now, as a Christian, I will tell you this, uh, I, I do believe Christ is the truth. And I, I believe the words are very firmly in the uh, in the scriptures, in the Sermon on the Mount. You know, when Christ says uh, in the Beatitudes, bless those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You know, if, if somebody is, tr is seeking the truth, if somebody is seeking to know God or what they think is God, God's going to communicate with them. <laughs> you know, he's, he does that work, not me, right? I mean, I, 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 this may, this is interesting. This, this is so fascinating because if people listening out there, so could I use this imagery? Um, I sense the classical education, but also, by the way, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with, we tried to do this at the school we, I worked in in Florida. Every, I would also, I, I would actually argue every school that's mm -hmm. ever existed since, you know, let's call them modern new world schools. And we do a lot of old world, new world on this. 
Every single school that's ever existed, every time a young person has walked under into the front doors, they've entered a type of religio, a type of religious experience mm -hmm. where the adults in that school are trying to bind them according to certain preeminent beliefs or a, a set of evident truths that, that, that the people who are in charge of that place agree upon. Mm -hmm. that that's my definition of religio of religion is that it's it's those things which bind the body so like ligament and religio yes my ligaments bind my body and so that i can be a whole i have ligaments in other words i have religio mm -hmm. it's the same root mm -hmm. and so every single person that's ever gone into something called a school is entering a religio the question is is what is at the top of the that religious hierarchy mm -hmm. and so for me that you have teachers that are bound by something called classical would only make sense in a school so mm -hmm. for me though and i'm going on a rant but i want you to to feel this for me for me when you go into ps 31 in new york city public school 31 those teachers are also bound by a religio, a set mm -hmm. of preeminent beliefs that hold the school together. And what are they? The problem is, is we don't ask or talk about what they are. They're assumed and they're secular and they're really just science. Mm -hmm. They're just materialism without the explanation. So right. here's my question is it feels mm -hmm. like, Every school that's ever existed is doing something like inviting people into a religion and then walking them to this, let's call it a cliff. Mm -hmm. Let's just call it a cliff. But the cliff has like a little footbridge, a really skinny one that's kind of scary. And so am I right to say that your school, like all schools, is walking kids through a series of pathways that lead them to the edge of something, sort of like the edge of their new life called 18-year-old mm -hmm. person? And then they have to walk across this scary footbridge and navigate these beliefs they've been given according to whatever comes next in their world. Are you comfortable with that explanation of, of classical education or really public education or Muslim education? Do you like that or does it feel off to you? No, I, I do like it. And the, the main reason is this. You know, at, at our school, we talk about the fact that parents are the first and most important educators of, of their children, right? So my wife and I have raised our children in a particular way. They've been educated classically. Uh, we've been, you know, guiding them in terms of, say, summa bonum or ton kalon, the ultimate good. Like, okay, we're, we're you know, he, here's what we do in our house. Here's what we do when, when we worship. That That's our ultimate goal. Knowing that at some point, you know, when they're at a certain age of maturity, uh, they have free will. They, they may go in a different direction. Uh, chances are they won't. Um, you know, that that's typically how it is when, when someone's been well formed in the home. And so, I I know for a second think that the school is the only mode of education for a child, right? And so, what what we want to do is to provide them, you know, with, with fundamental uh, uh, abilities. And knowledge, dispositions, and affections that are that are hopefully in concert with what the parents are doing at home, but the education continues, right? So they're they're largely influenced by their their family background, but then it, it goes on beyond us. And so most of our students, you know, go to college, some go to military, some do mission work, etc. We we want to give them this foundation, and and part of the foundation at, at any classical school is going to be this idea that there is a highest good. Now, in a Christian classical school, they're going to say very specifically the highest good is Christ, right? Uh, in, in a classical charter school, because of the kinds of texts that we read and the discussions we have, that idea, right, is, is going to come across the, the student's desk, so to speak. We're not going to promote it uh, explicitly you know, in the classroom. But again, going back to what I said before, as a Christian, I do believe Christ is the truth. And if somebody's tr truly seeking the highest good, They'll be led in that direction, but that's and and <laughs> and so the the education you're offering your kids and other kids is complementary to what you hope becomes a full fledged belief in in Christ resurrected. Okay, 
One of the things that I, one of the distinctions I've come to, Mm -hmm. I wonder what you think about this. I can't say that I was taught this, but I think I was taught this by various people, especially within orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. And historically you see it. It feels like classical education hopes that when you're done with 18 years of whatever, you're a really good thinker and most thoughts are about God Mm -hmm. or the good. And I think public education in the secular sense, the scientific materialist sense, hopes you're a really good thinker and most of your thoughts are about yourself. Mm -hmm. You like that? Does that sound true? I think that's (laughs) That's what I I think we're creating narcissists myself. I think that's true to some extent. Um, Yeah. So look, just considering this from an orthodox perspective, you know, thought, thoughts are the cause of all sin and error, right? Uh, but thoughts are also the cause yeah. of uh, virtue, right? Uh, to lead you on the right path. And so, you know, I, I think many of our schools, and I'm just saying, let, let me just make, make a digression here for a second. I am not suggesting, because I'm, I'm, I'm promoting classical schools, that there are not wonderful uh, teachers in public schools there aren't good human beings that are doing wonderful things in individual classrooms sure. same thing with school leaders but i'm saying the philosophy that's guiding that ship is severely flawed and, and it so it therefore limits you know what those good, good people can do um so mm. I, I i guess the idea is the wisdom from the past whether it's from the church specifically or out of philosophy or something is lacking in modern schools such that they don't students never come across the idea that they have passions to begin with, that they have these sort of faculties within them, intellectual, uh, uh, Mm. spiritual, that guide them in one way or the other, and that they ought to uh, know what they are to be in control of them because those things are going to lead them down a good or or a bad path, right? So, I mean, that's just one example of how, you know, in in a classical school, you, you have such a tremendous life advantage. Right, just to understand that basic, so going, going, North Yosef John, right, is the famous phrase that uh, was at the Oracle of Delphi and, and the philosopher said, no, how do you know yourself, right? You, you, it's not just something that you, you do coming out of the womb. Somebody has to guide you to understand that mm-hmm. self-knowledge mm-hmm. is an essential part of our humanity. If we're, if we're not aware that we're, we're narcissistic, that we're prideful, that we love ourselves, et cetera, et cetera, yeah, how are we going to proceed in life? How are we going to be good spouses? How are we going to be good parents? Right? How, how are we going to? How are we going to ascend to the highest good? We won't. So, so anthropology seems important to a classical educator. Um, in the Orthodox tradition, it's not anthropology; it's theanthropology. Right? We're we're God and man. We're 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 of God in the same way that God is of us. Mm-hmm. We're similar to God that way. We're like God that way um can you teach okay here we go can you teach a story of a man of a human being rising out of the soup through natural means can you tell that story over and over again and still teach classical education Mm -hmm. well at our school uh what we do there because we are accountable to, to state standards in the area of natural science. We, we teach w- what that theory is, but we don't teach that as a truth. We teach that as a, a hypothesis or a theory. Here is, here is what developed uh, more formally beginning in the 19th century, but it is an ancient idea. Ancient pre- some of the ancient pre-Socratic philosophers yeah, had this somewhat. idea as well, right? Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, systematic or fully developed, but yeah, he, here is this idea. Right, but it's not something that we treat, uh, teach as a as a fact, as a truth. We also teach, especially from from the 20th century, what are what are the other ideas that some some other scientists are coming up with, and you know that's a, that's a developing area of science to this day. Um, and and you, you've probably heard um, many of the headlines that that uh, like this Darwinian theory is in crisis right now because of scientific discoveries, not not because of religious yeah. religious just, ideas, you know. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Which is really interesting. Have you ever had the idea that this is what's happened to me? And mm-hmm. I, again, now we're going down a bit of a rabbit hole, but have you ever noticed that the scientific discoveries always seem to follow, not lead, they always seem to follow the spiritual disposition of a culture, of the people in the culture? 
I am fully convinced as I get older that there's no such thing as a scientific discovery. Mm -hmm. that, that there's no independent scientific discovery. What's happening is the data that's being mined through the scientific method is being informed by mm -hmm. the spiritual disposition of the miner. And, and then if you think, start to think about that, it gets really freaky is you'll find sort of the thing your spirit is pointing toward. Mm -hmm. um, in that sense, science is dead if I'm right. And I, I don't know, I'm just going down a rabbit hole and having fun with some philosophy. I don't know what you think about that. But in that sense, there is no objective science. Mm -hmm. And then as a charter school, now look, I'm just throwing stuff around. You don't have to believe any of this, but as a mm -hmm. charter school, you must have some razor edge conversations about this stuff because public funding is heading your way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You must have so many interesting philosophical issues that probably also keep you up at night about what does it mean to take public money to do quote private things? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, you know, going back to, to to the initial, you know, topic of, of science. I mean, the, the the beautiful thing about science is that it's always open to inquiry. It's always open to protest. I mean, th that's what science is supposed to be. I mean, uh, you know, take, it takes a long time for something to go from a hypothesis to even a theory, and then eventually to eventual all, let's say, right? And so, uh, you know, something that has 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 sort of stood you know, on a, on a platform for generations could, could be taken down w w with a new discovery. And so it's not really mm -hmm. science, you know, like just to go back to Darwinian ideas, so, some of which are true, like what we call, what people call sort of uh, micro evolution or smaller changes over time, right? But, changes over time. Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's obviously true. And he, there were some good things that came out of that to be sure. Um, you know, but we're seeing now that, 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 that you know, that, that, the original idea, certainly the ones from Descent of Man <laughs> have really, you know, come down the stairs, you know, over time as, as they ought to with new discoveries, right? Uh, so I, I would say this, though, Here, here's what happens. And this is, this is why a, a classical, another reason why classical education is so important. If you only have a, a few loud voices in science who have a political axe or a religious axe to grind and they're promoting a certain idea, as law, when in fact it's not, and nobody else is speaking up or can speak up in an eloquent way, then that those small voices, you know, overtake the rest. And this is this is what happens in all realms of our society, right? So w within the last several years, of course, we've had this whole, you know, experience uh, with the woke phenomenon. Like the vast majority of the people don't believe most of these things that are being that are being spouted, but they're afraid right. to speak, right. and perhaps they don't have the tools to speak well against them. Right. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so rhetoric is, is extremely important here. It's so interesting. I think of, I always say, when people say show the science, I always go, no, no, no. Show me where people go on Sunday or Saturday or Friday who are doing the science. Mm -hmm. Like if they're, if they're the coffee shop guy reading the New York times and he's the scientist. Okay. I, I know what's happening. <laughs> like, Show me the science means show me where the guy is or the woman is at the mm -hmm. time that's most sacred to them. And I'll show you someone that's, that's producing a type of science, a Muslim type of science, mm -hmm. a Christian Orthodox type of science. I don't believe that there's just a science and, and that makes me postmodern on some level, but I find it fascinating because it becomes true and true each day, more and more true as you start to watch scientific institutions make sense of spiritual problems. They mm -hmm. can't, you know what I mean? Yes. They, they collapse and that's what's happening. And yet you're in Texas trying to educate people classically. What's the best part of your job? Mm. What's the, the part that makes you happiest? Teaching. So one of the things that that headmasters historically do is they, they teach a little bit, at least one class. Uh, so, you know, the word headmaster has its origins in the, in the UK and Britain. So headmaster is the head administrator, but he or she is also the head instructor, right? And so master, I, yeah. I, I've been, yeah, the master, the teacher, the mistress, right? So I've been headmaster for 12 years. Each, each of the years, 
the exception of this one due to some health, health issues, I've taught one class per year. And that's the highlight of my day. Going, I, I've, I've taught a West Civ one class, which is about the Hebrews, Greeks, and Romans. I, I love that. I, I look forward to that every single day, being with the students. And my, my philosophy is, look, if you don't let, love to teach as an administrator, you should not be leading a school. You should want to be in a classroom uh, every single day, whether it's teaching or observing other classes going on. And so uh, I, I would say that's it. And, and the benefit of it, just beyond sort of personal fulfillment is, I get to I get to learn about the pulse of the school in ways that I wouldn't be because I have this relationship with students, and it helps me in my relationship with the other faculty members because they're not going to say and you might may recall this as a as a educator you know where a principal at a school makes some kind of a decision and then during the major faculty meeting you hear the the snickering in the back oh he's forgotten what it's like to be a teacher you know right. that, they're not going to say that about sure. me I, I prepare lessons i teach them i grade things i communicate with parents as an instructor of their children i'm in the trenches right and so it has all kinds of benefits yeah. but i'd say that's 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 one of the things for sure now Look, I, I have a great benefit of being in a kindergarten through 12th grade school. So I see the kids when they're five and I see them when they're 18. And, and watching wow, that growth wow. over time is, is beautiful. It, it really is. It's a hard job, too, that you're doing. Um, it's hard. Can I ask you, It's we talked earlier. Mm -hmm. I think I want to really ask you this, and you said it's okay. But you recently in the last year, uh you've been battling hard against some serious metastatic cancer that was all over. Yes. And here you, you sit alive. So guys, that's a blessing and an incredible uh, type of, it's, it's, it's a miracle of sorts. Yes. So what happened to your ideas during your darkest battle? And you know, everybody's going to battle against death. It's coming. I don't know how mm -hmm. long the battle might be in your immediate mind, but it was for you right there in present. Yes. What happened to the ideas of education? You know, the ideas, like, you know, thinking about education, did it become more important to you in your darkest battle or did it become sort of a thing you could set aside more easily? What happened to the ideas of education as you were really in trouble and, and fighting hard against mm -hmm. uh, cancer? Well, I'd say a couple of things. You know, one is that, those ideas and those experiences have formed me. So I continued in them. They, they helped me, you know, in my journey. Right. Mm. Um, so, you, you know, that, that, that's the whole, one of the big ideas about classical education, it's formative. And, and we think about the students being formed over time, but the people that are in the school leading it, teaching in it are also being formed. So I like to think that I was strengthened, you know, in, in, in my character. But ultimately, uh, you know, I, I place my hope and trust in God, knowing that, look, I may not, uh, I may not have a, you know, like a good end in terms of any kind of healing. Uh, but I, I didn't think about my plight every day. I thought about doing the things I needed to do every day, which was to continue to pray and worship, try to take care of myself the best way I could, to let others who were helping me help me. And, and focus on, on positive and higher things. Uh, because, you know, he, and, and this actually connects back to that science topic you were bringing up before. One of the, one of the problems in, in modern medicine, you know, in conventional medicine in particular, is that it is so uh, sort of narrowly uh, em focused on sort of the science, uh, you know, what is, what is uh, shown in research, et cetera. It's very, very medicinally driven. You know, whereas mm -hmm. there's this whole other area of medicine that you might call naturalistic, homeopathic, whatever it is, that, that have have wonderful elements to them as well, and it'd be great to bl to blend them together in a better way. Right. Now, it, there are a lot of individuals right. that do that, like that, that get connected to integrated medicine. I think so too. Yeah, um, and I've been I've benefited from that myself. So I I did, uh, you know, go through a conventional route in terms of some treatments, but I also used homeopathic treatments and. One of the big things I did was I changed my my whole regimen, eating and everything, uh, 180 degrees. And even during all of I had chemotherapy, I had radiation, etc. Even during all of that, which was treacherous, uh, including physically, where you lose all of your hair and your body, etc. Like I, I felt good in some ways because of the lifestyle I was I was living, and then knowing that I had so many people praying for me in, in my church community, at school, people that I didn't even know. 
uh, it, it, it was a wonderful feeling and I, and I felt the benefit of that. I, I do believe in efficacy of prayer. And even though I know not everyone's prayers uh, have the same force, I, I, I had a philosophy which might be different from some people who a lot of times like to keep their cancer quiet because there's such a stigma related to it. I would let everybody know, not like I'm bragging that I have cancer, but pray for right, me right. because <laughs> because I thought, you know, maybe there's one holy, really holy person out there who's going to pray for me and, and benefit me more than I can imagine, you know? <laughs> And I, and I, I think and hope, you know, that, that Plus, was the case. we're co-sufferers. We're That's co-sufferers. Right. Th th see, this is pretty crazy, right? It's like your suffering is mine on some level, even as, especially as Orthodox Christians, we're connected, but we're, all of humanity, right? All the great, all the saints talk about the connection we have with, with creation. Mm -hmm. So here you are. In the trench is doing something for me. Your suffering and your willingness to give it up to me as a potential for prayer for me, it emboldens me. Yes. My wife sees this as a nurse practitioner in palliative mm. care. So she wow. she always sees that the pain has to be spread. Mm -hmm. So we think of that as the worst possible thing. So the stoic inclination in us is to... What she says, no because I'm co-suffering. I'm already suffering. You know, classically, everyone thinks this is a Buddhist concept, like life is suffering. Well, check into Christianity. We, we, yes. We've been saying that, 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 that's a thing. And so if life is suffering and I know that you're struggling on some level and I can be a part of it, then I take some of it. From, that's the actual Christic message. I'm taking this from you. Mm -hmm. and so we should be like that for others. But it's hard because I think so much. We're in this battle of religio all the time. Is And I, I always, when people talk to me, they're like, are you Orthodox? I'm like, eh, probably not. <laughs> you know, probably not. Uh, I was baptized, but probably um, pray for me because it's a mess. You know, mm. because I'm not always that thing, always at the same time at one time. So anyway, well, I, in, so in, can we look? I, oh, go ahead, Jason. Well, sorry. you know, th this topic of suffering connects back to one of the deficits in modern education. We don't parents, many parents and certainly schools don't want students to struggle. They don't want them to suffer. They don't want them to overcome the major obstacles, right. which then denies them the benefit uh, of going through that suffering and coming out on the other end stronger, right? Whereas certainly in the Orthodox faith, we, 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 we recognize that suffering is an integral part of our humanity. And in fact, you know, if we're going to follow Christ, right, we have to do what? Take up our crosses. Uh, there's, there's, no, there's no Christianity without the cross. And we have as uh, St. Innocent of Alaska said in his work, you know, there are big crosses and little crosses. I, I, I've had obviously lots of crosses like anybody throughout their lives. I had a very big one. I am in a big one still with really, as it relates to cancer. But this is, these are ways that, that uh, help you to learn, to grow, and, and, and to enter into communion with God. I, I would say one of the, the great joys of this experience for me, despite the, the struggles, was firming up my faith. You know, giving me and even yeah. giving me more time at home to pray and to read and to worship. You know that you know you you want to do you know throughout your life, but uh, some things help you to focus a little more. In fact, a friend of mine in the early stages of my cancer said uh, he he quoted Saint Paisius to me, who said that cancer populates paradise. So uh, wh wow. whether whether you die in the short term from cancer or pass at a later age, uh, you know we have a goal. And if, if suffering like this helps you to grow in your faith, then that's ultimately a good thing. My, I'll, I'll end with this, but my brother and I and my sister were sitting there as my dad's cancer diagnosis came. Mm. He's since, he's since fallen asleep, but this was happening in real time. My brother's a uh, Orthodox priest mm -hmm. and uh, he's sitting there and the doctor's not, it's not good. Like, it's bad and my brother goes he like slaps the table and he says this is so good because you have this time he was like how long is it gonna take he's like asking the doctor, how long is it gonna take what do you think and he's like you know three to six months 
He was like, this is great. You, you're you set because you can repent and you can be a part of this process of preparing mm-hmm. yourself. Man, he was like all happy. Like, I'm not kidding. And I was looking at him like, what in the world? And he was right. But my father was able, he passed through that part. Something else got him. He got, he had an aneurysm, essentially mm-hmm. a stroke. Point being, that's a crazy way to think. But somehow it's possible um, to stay in that space if you understand yourself as theanthropos and not simply anthropo, not simply animal, you know. It's an interesting, interesting concept. So I'm going to, we're going to link all your, your school and everything. And, okay. and I hope I didn't irritate you with my questions. It was nice. Consider us a friend over at First Things and on our podcast. And um, check out our dinners at uh, the supers we're throwing at our restaurant. If you ever want to do one at your school, I think it fits perfectly with the classical education ethos, um, the kind of things we're trying to do at First Things overseas and here at home. So and we talked a little bit about that. But it sounds like yes. your school is, is, is blessed, man. It's growing. It is growing. It's, it's thriving. Thank God. Yeah. Thank. Thank. It's, it's. It was great speaking with you. I enjoyed the conversation. W- wish you the best with your your ministries there, and uh, you know, wish you a blessed thank Lent, you. as they say in some monastic communities, Kalo Stadio, good stadium. Yes. That's during right. this that's Lenten right. period. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent, guys. Uh, Jason, thanks for coming on, and uh, we'll be in touch. We'll be in touch. Sounds great. Well, I'll see you guys soon in whatever. Guys, we have our monthly donor, recurring donor meetup, which we just did, which was wonderful. Some really nice people. People from all over, too. Wichita, Missouri, California, Los Angeles, Canada. I really enjoy talking to donors. Become one. Recurring donors. Give $5 a month. I don't know. Do something. Make the energy happen. Right? Allow the spirit to flow. If you think I sound like I'm some sort of weirdo, I'm not. I know what happens when people weigh in. And they weigh in with something, a store of value. And they weigh in and they become a part of something and offer their energy. Value is created. It's the nature of creation. Sacrifice. Creation begins with sacrifice. Go take a little bit of your dough and offer it the first things that matters. www.first-things.org. Join us at Art of Tamada. Support our impresario projects directly. But mostly, let's keep talking at the table. It matters. It matters. The world is coming apart. Hey, maybe next time we'll talk about Candace. Candace Owen. The world is coming apart as it probably should. And as it maybe always has. Peace to you. Everything's lightly. See you next week. Peace out.